and welcome to NOAA Rounds 4, Session 9. Please join me in welcoming our presenter, Dr. Hugh Lloyd Ellis, who is a professor of economics at Queen's University. Uh, today, he will be speaking on quantifying the economic impacts of COVID-19 policy responses on Canada's provinces in almost real time. Uh, this is some really interesting work that uh, is hits on a theme that we've talked about in other installments of rounds, looking at the relationship between public health uh, efforts and um, e the whole economy uh, impacts of COVID. And uh, what's particularly interesting and, and kind of relevant for this community about this work is that it will be continuing in, and extended in the uh, efforts of the One Society Network that was recently announced that will be uh, led in part by uh, IHE with um, all of the participating universities. Uh, you can go to the IHE website if you want to see more about that. And soon there will be a One Society Network website. Um, before we begin, I'll go over some event housekeeping. Participants throughout the webinar will remain muted to submit any questions during the webinar. Please use the questions function in the GoToWebinar interface. Um, if you have a hard time finding it, look for something with a question mark on it. Um, during Q&A, I will read the questions to Hugh, and we, if you have follow-up questions, keep piling them into the questions box. And uh, yeah, we'll reserve all those questions for the final 20, 10 or 20 minutes of the presentation when Dr. Lloyd Ellis is done. And with that, I will hand over to Dr. Hugh Lloyd Ellis. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kate. Um, so uh, as this slide I've got up here uh, uh, indicates, I'm a professor of, econo of economics at Queen's University. And I'm also uh, involved with um, a group called Limestone Analytics uh, as an ac academic economic advisor. And uh, some of the funding for some of this research has um, been associated with them. Okay, so, um, the research behind this talk um, has sort of various elements to it. Um, and uh, there's actually a, a, an academic article associated with it, uh, with uh, which is illustrated here. And it's the co-authors here, uh, you know, this is a team effort as usual. And so uh, the co-authors include Chris Cotton, Brett Crowley, Barman Kashi, and France, uh, Francois Tremblay. Um, sorry, Frederic Tremblay. And uh, there's a, a number of policy uh, briefs that have been uh, put out associated with some of this work. And it also it's been involved in um, Global Canada's COVID Strategic Choices Group, um, who've been pushing for this thing called the Canadian Shield. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And as Kate mentioned as well, um, going forward, uh, we're interacting uh, quite a bit with uh, IHE, um, through this NSERC um, One Society Network. So I just want to start by motivating uh, kind of the questions that we're interested in here. And this is, you know, a lot of what I, my, my area in uh, Queens is uh, development economics and macroeconomics. So I'm coming at this more of a macro perspective, but, but of course, there's a lot of uh, micro elements to this. Um, so one of the, the sort of broad question here is why do we need estimates of the economic costs of COVID-19 and in particular the policy responses to it? And so this is uh, obviously been a debate that's going, been going on ever since the beginning of uh, this crisis. Um, uh, this here's some articles from various journals back in back around this time last year, um, focusing a lot on these trade-offs between e economics and the epidemiology. Um, associated with COVID-19. And of course, we understand uh, now, um, and this is, you know, still, all these things are still issues now, what the, tr the short-run trade-offs uh, are, or many of them anyway. The benefits of the lockdowns include reducing, obviously, the prevalence of illness, reducing mortality. I think we've um, come to the conclusion in many cases, at least, that these have been uh, effectively um, impacted by these lockdowns. And uh, one of the major factors that, of course, has been paramount, especially in the most recent wave, um, is preventing the healthcare system from being overwhelmed. But of course, these lockdowns have costs, and we're focusing a lot in this 
in this analysis on the cost side. Um, and in particular, the reductions in employment and, uh, and output and consumption that are associated with those lockdowns. But there's also uh, other factors which we're becoming increasingly aware of, increasing inequality, for example, um, due to the sort of diverse impact of these shocks on different groups, uh, the interruptions to education and learning, as, um, as we've seen, and also um, a multitude of other health uh, impacts, some, some of which um, we don't fully understand yet, I think. So, you know, this, um, in general, the, the short-term perspective on this has been largely portrayed as this trade-off between lives and livelihoods. Now, of course, um, one could argue that we should just focus on saving lives and not worry so much about the economic costs, and that that's a, a, a viewpoint that I've often heard people um, put forward. But of course, in practice, that never really happens. Um, you know, if we just think about the annual flu, we don't um, impose the same kind of restrictions in the economy to deal with that, despite the fact that it has a big impact, uh, a health impact, in, especially in certain years. So there's, there's always this trade-off, and you know, we, we are often asking the question, and we're asking it right now, at what point and where, in terms of geographical locations, should these restrictions be relaxed? And as we know, different regions have made different and difficult decisions about this. There's a lot of variation around the world and also in Canada. The point I'm trying to make here is, though, we'd like these decisions to be a, a, as well informed as possible. And understanding the economic costs and that basically figuring out what they are um, is an important part of that. Another aspect of that, of course, is that it's not just a national um, uh, analysis that we need. We need a more regionalized analysis of these impacts. So when we started thinking about some of these problems uh, over a year ago now, um, you know, we, we wanted to think about these particular issues. Now, of course, there's also, it's not just a short run perspective that's important uh, in th thinking about these economic costs. There's also a, a, a more medium term perspective. Um, and that is, you know, can the tight restrictions that, imp that are imposed now, can more tight restrictions being imposed now pay off later? And as many of you uh, may have uh, seen back in uh, uh, earlier in the pandemic, um, there was a, a discussion about this. Um, one of the sort of most well-known articles on this discussed suggestive evidence from the 1918 uh, flu pandemic um, in the, across U.S. cities, and arguing that um, you know uh, cities that lock down more in a more restrictive way early on, um, and consequently had lower mortality rates, benefited from this later on in terms of growth. Now, there's been some debate about this, but uh, you know, this is still a crucial question today. Um, and it depends on you know, a lot of things. It depends on the rate of recovery of different sectors in the economy, it depends on the interconnections along the supply curve, and also on the seasonal nature of economic activity. So we're gonna, we wanna talk a little bit, wanna think a little bit about that too. And then a final reason for thinking about uh, the economic costs, why we need these under, to understand what these costs are and actually figure out roughly what they are at least, is from a longer term perspective, uh, and that what, by which I mean you know, anticipating future waves, perhaps of the, of the current um, pandemic or uh, future pandemics more generally, we wanna think about these costs and set them against the investments that could be undertaken to avoid those costs in the future. So uh, when we think about the expenditures that, or the investments that have to be made uh, in, in terms of preventative measures, critical in health in infrastructure and associated human capital, um, these are important costs, that they could, they're significant costs, but when we're thinking about them, we should be comparing these investments to the expected costs of future lockdowns that would occur if we didn't have these investments, undertake these investments. Of course, this is a very difficult question, but it's important to start thinking about these costs um, as we go forward. So 
back in uh, sort of April and May 2020, um, a, group, a group of us here were thinking about a lot of these issues and how to think about modeling the economic impact of COVID-19. And one of the key um, issues that we were concerned with at the time, we were talking to uh, policymakers and, and decision makers in, in, in the local region here. And they're, they're, one of the things that they're particularly interested in figuring out was, you know, month to month, what are the impacts um, as we go forward through this pandemic? So this is, uh, this is what I mean by almost real time. So we were motivated uh, to a large extent by kind of, um, uh, sorry, by quotes like this one from uh, Bahawi and, um, um, sorry, Bawai and Fahi. And uh, this is just an example, but as you see, it says here, uh, COVID-19 is an unusual macroeconomic shock. It's a messy combination of disaggregated supply and demand shocks. These shocks propagate through supply chains to create different cyclical conditions in different parts of the economy. Some sectors are tight, constrained by supply constraints and struggling to keep up with the demand, while other sectors are slack and shedding workers to reduce excess capacity because of lack of demand. So, I mean, I think this is a, a nice um, description of, of some of the issues that arise during, uh, have arisen during this process. So the, the kinds of modeling challenges that we started to think about were thinking about these multi-sectoral impacts, the dynamic supply chains, that is constraints that occur from month to month or even from week to week, uh, production in one sector, which affects production in the next sector because their inputs to, the, to another sector, um, how that evolves over time. And of course, it led us down the, um, the, the, you know, down the line of thinking of input output structures in the economy. So we wanted to have a, some, a, a framework that we could allow us to, um, to think about these things, also allow us to um, think about supply and demand restrictions within that context, and also allow us to think about high frequency estimates that were um, what were needed at the time, and still are, I guess. And when we start thinking about high frequency estimates, we're thinking about data that's available at a relatively high frequency, um, which you know limits the extent to which what, what data is available, obviously. And when we start thinking about this very short term kind of analysis, um, we have to take into account a lot of issues regarding seasonality, for example, different periods of the year, uh, you know, how that would, how the interactions between sectors of the economy are affected by uh, the month that we're in. And we also wanted to think a little bit about the re regionalized impacts of these um, various effects in the economy, in particular at the provincial level, at least, because a lot of the decisions that are getting made um, on the on the policy side are at the provincial level, as we see, um, and a lot of the restrictions vary across provinces. But even even more than that, they go you know they go to a lower level um, to sort of public health districts. So we've we've tried to think about how we could uh, inter you know uh, include these kinds of regionalized impacts um, in our analysis. And then in addition. As we've said before, as I mentioned before, that, that the impacts are, are different across different worker groups. And so we wanted to try to understand how these, um, these different groups, different age groups, different ethnic groups, for example, or different um, groups in different industries would be affected. And at the same time, we want to have, have a framework that's flexible, that could respond to changing conditions. One of the things that we've un, uh, learned as we've gone through this is how, you know, the, cha the changes in policy can change from week to week um, uh, on a dime. So, um, so this our modeling exercise needs to be quite flexible in response to changes in the kinds of scenarios that we're thinking about going forward. So in our view, uh, some of the limitations of existing models or estimates that, uh, that we could have used most of many of these are sort of annual estimates, perhaps quarterly forecasting. A lot of the models that are being used um, 
by uh, say Conference Board of Canada or, um, uh, 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 or the banks, but they're not designed specifically to think about month to month um, decisions or scenarios, and they're not necessarily designed to specifically for lockdowns. So um, we wanted to develop a framework that we could try to use to think about short or medium term scenario building in particular. And one thing I should stress is this is not about forecasting the future per se, it's about given different scenarios of how policies, we might think policies are going to evolve, um, how would we, holding other things constant, how would we affect, they would affect the costs um, to the economy. The estimates that are provided by Statistics Canada also, you know, uh, um, available, uh, but they tend to be available for the national economy in particular, and not so much for the provinces in the short term. So with, a, with about a two or three month lag, you can get estimates of GDP, for example, by industry at the national level. Um, provincial estimates of GDP tend to only come, uh, become available with a, a somewhat longer lag. So we wanted to basically figure out what we could do, the best we could do, given um, uh, this, you know, the, the, these holes in the, in the available data for short and term, uh, medium term scenario building. So what we ended up with was what we've referred to as the studio model, uh, and it's specifically, specifically focused for, on Canadian provinces, although uh, we've also started to think about applications to other um, countries. And it's intended as a planning pool, uh, tool sorry, to help policymakers um, quantify the economic costs of alternative scenarios that are related with different um, lockdown policies and potentially different demand changes that are you know, being observed in the economy. And this is in a context of relatively uh, data scarce um, situations where we're relying on the data we have available basically. And, and so this is, uh, this is the nature of it. And as I said before, you shouldn't think of this as a forecasting tool, um, but rather a scenario comparison tool, basically. So, uh, so this studio stands for short-term undercapacity dynamic input output model. Um, and uh, the idea is it's responsive to new data as it becomes available, accounts for the economic costs and I'll be a bit more specific about what I mean by that shortly. Um, reflects the dynamic impact of supply constraints and um, it allows us to sort of do these projections that consider various scenarios that, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of uncertainty regarding what would, is likely to happen. And we've relied a lot on um, input from uh, epidemiologists, epidemi I can never say that word, epidemiologists that, um, that uh, uh, telling us exactly what they, their modeling implies and also what they believe is going to happen in terms of the pressure on the health system. So that's a very important input, obviously. And I, I, I want to stress as well that we, in our modeling, we don't believe that we are able to model the evolution of the disease very well. We're not very good at that. So we're taking the epidemiological um, uh, forecasts and there can sort of consensus on this and uh, and building that into the scenarios we're considering rather than trying to do it ourselves which would not work out very well and then as I said we we're trying to regionalize the impacts of all of this and as I've mentioned um, you know the, the the sort of key kind of flavor of this is to try to capture ec economic production networks over time um, and so we're trying to think about, you know, situations where the supply chains and interregional trade between provinces in particular connect different economies and different sectors. And so we're trying to capture the, including all of this, the effects across sectors and locations of different kinds of shocks or constraints on uh, employment. So, you know, I guess economists are often used to thinking about this, but just as an example, um, they, there are kind of compounding effects. If we shut down restaurants in Toronto, um, obviously there's a direct effect on those who work at um, those restaurants, but also on the, the suppliers of those restaurants and those who work for the suppliers um, are going to be impacted 
and those uh, workers are going to uh, shopping or, or or buying stuff from other sectors, and they're going to be impacted, and so on. So there's a there's a you know, magnifying effect spreading through the economy, and exactly how that uh, um, interacts with other sectors depends on the constraints that they face too. So um, so that's you know that's the flavor of the type of uh, modeling we're doing here. So as I said, the main components of this studio uh, model. Are the, are the mapping of economic interconnections between different sectors and locations through supply chains and also worker consumer links. Um, the dynamic production and recovery process we're modeling, which tries to account for inventory accumulation and also kind of it lags in re rehiring and expansion. And the point, of course, is, and this is going to be important as I'll say in a bit, is that you know, when, when we think about lifting restrictions, Recovery takes time, and the economy doesn't return to normal as soon as these restrictions are lifted, as we've already seen, um, and uh, that plays an important role here. So, what I should say is, you know, a lot of what we're doing here isn't com isn't completely new. We're putting together uh, um, lots of things that are already out there, um, and so what Studio does is essentially combines a, a dynamic uh, I.O. model, input-output model, that was originally designed to assess the impacts of supply constraints due to natural disasters. And I sort of highlighted the term supply constraints here, because often people criticize I.O. frameworks um, because they don't have supply constraints. But this dynamic framework does allow for that. So, um, um, so that's an important aspect of it. And these dynamic constraints take uh, uh, take impact over uh, different sectors over time. And of course, we're calibrating this model with uh, provincial input output tables, which uh, are available from Statistics Canada. Um, and one thing I should mention about this is one thing that where Canada's uh, got a, an advantage over many other countries, in particular the US, where it's difficult to actually get state level. Um, uh, input output freight, uh, tables that have been developed by uh, say the BEA, most of this has been farmed out to private sector um, uh, groups. And um, we're also using information from the labor force survey and that's a lot of what's coming in on a, on a more frequent basis for a monthly basis. Um, and we're we're obviously, when we're thinking about what are the costs, we have to be comparing to what we expect would have happened in different industries and in different provinces over time in the absence of COVID. So where to do that kind of counterfactual, of course, is tricky, um, but we're using uh, pre-COVID industry forecasts from the Conference Board of Canada to do that. And then to think about more regional and more micro uh, implications, we uh, we have census estimates that we're using, um, you know, based on employment shares in different regions and different uh, sectors of the economy. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, a big input to this is the epidemiological forecasts and assessments that we, I mentioned before. So the way to think about this studio framework is to, it's, it's the combination of all of these things. So, uh, and of course, that was a pretty non-technical overview. I didn't, I, given the time here, I don't want to get into all the weeds, I guess, but uh, hopefully that gives a flavor of what, of what we're trying to do. So what we're essentially doing is um, um, assessing various epidemiological and policy scenarios. Um, you, you give us a prediction of how policies may evolve over time, uh, the, including how the how we'd expect the recovery process to, to go and how we expect future waves to evolve over time. And that depends, of course, on the epidemiological forecast. And then Studio is going to basically do it, is essentially doing an accounting exercise um, and allowing for these interactions across sectors um, that estimates the economic costs of COVID under each scenario by location and industry. And the costs, um, what, what we're measuring them in terms of, are uh, full-time um, equivalent employment, so which is essentially hours, aggregate hours, and gross domestic product. And just a reminder, uh, you know, sometimes the word gross, gross domestic product uh, can maybe seem a little abstract 
talk about production, what does that really mean? But of course, we understand that you know what's produced is the value of what's produced is is income. Um, ultimately, goes to, to goes to different um, uh, uh, people in terms of income. 63% of that, um, roughly speaking, is labor income. 11% um, of it is net direct taxes going to the government, net of um, subsidies. And then 26% um, uh, of it is various kinds of operating surplus that would go to, in terms of interest, rent, and profits. So my point here is just to point out that GDP is, is, is people's income. And so part of what we've been we've been working on is um, trying to break this down by economic regions and we're, we're actually going down to the census division level um, um, in terms of these estimates so basically using this structure of the provincial structure of production and uh, interacting that with census estimates of what of uh, you know pre-existing employment shares in different uh, areas um, and using that to try to estimate the impact on different regions so down to the here we have an example from this dashboard we set up, which was actually asked, you know, re requested by um, uh, local decision makers in, in this area, and we'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and it basically breaks things down uh, as much as possible. Of course, there's a lot of assumptions and estimates here that uh, one could debate, but that's, you know, that's the basic idea. So, um, so we can, this dashboard, for example, is just looking at things by geographic region, here we have Eastern Ontario. We actually have done this for the whole of all the regions in Canada, basically. Um, and uh, we can we allow people to consider alternative scenarios. This is kind of a very sort of policy oriented type of um, uh, dashboard, I guess. And then looking over different time periods. So when when we're talking about this impact, we're talking both about past impacts in terms of uh, you know which are we're estimating the impacts of. But, but also for future impacts in terms of these different scenarios. So, and I'll explain a little bit more about what these scenarios that are illustrated here uh, mean. And then of course, because we're doing this at the industry level to start with, we, we also have estimates by industry um, and, uh, and also estimates by region by industry. Okay, so those are the kind of outputs of this type of modeling. Um, and, you know, over time, we're learning about how good these estimates are. Some of them are better than others. Um, and so uh, that's kind of the process here. So, so that just gives a very, I guess, you know, high level uh, overview of what we've kind of, what we've been trying to do in terms of the modeling. Um, and so I just wanted to briefly talk about some of the broad implications of the time I have left here. And again, of course, the intent here is 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 uh, to look at lots of different possible things depending on what people are interested in. So uh, there's lots of potential uh, things I could talk about here, but I'm just going to talk about very broad implications um, um, of of the imp implications of this modeling. So the first thing is kind of obvious, but uh, it puts a number on the things, I guess. And that is, uh, if we look at, if we, we aggregate all of this over the entire economy, so this is aggregated at the industry level up to the provincial level and then um, across Canada. Um, obviously, COVID has been very costly, and the number we um, have estimated based on our modeling over the period just over 2020, so between March and December 2020, so this is relative to what we would have expected given forecasts. Um, prior to COVID of what would expected to happen over this period. And these are the estimates that we get. So uh, $165 billion um, dollars loss of, our, of GDP. And uh, it's a cumulative loss. And then in terms of um, annualized job loss, this is full-time equivalent job loss, about 1.4 million um, across Canada. So these are huge losses, obviously. I think everyone understands that there are losses. This amounts to the GDP loss amounts to just over 8% of what was expected, the GDP that would have been expected in 2020 based on Conference Board of Canada forecast at that time, uh, prior to 2020. 
Now we can, of course, break this down in lots of different ways. Um, this graph actually, this table, sorry, shows um, the breakdown in terms of the sectoral contribution to the GDP lost uh, by province during 2020 that we've estimated. Um, and this is these are ranked in terms of their, uh, you know, their impact in Canada. It varies by province, but we rank them in terms of the overall impact on Canada. And you can see the different provinces here are heterogeneous in terms of the impact, but there's obviously a lot of commonalities. Um, and uh, obviously, the the, pro the provincial uh, abbreviations there, I hope, are obvious. Um, but one of the things you see here, for example, uh, uh, in terms of these contributions, this is this, you know, the, lot, the percentage of GDP lost, uh, the contribution to the overall lost percentage of GDP. Um, one of the sectors which uh, is further down the list than you might expect is accommodation food services, uh, and it's, uh, it's about fifth here. Um, whereas uh, one sector you might be surprised at is the financial sector, uh, as being, as being top of the list overall in Canada anyway. Now, of course, that reflects a um, composition effect that's going on here. If we look at hours lost, by province, we get a somewhat different picture. Uh, wholesale and retail traders are at the top of both lists, so quite high at the top of both lists. But accommodation and food services would be much higher up the list when we think about hours lost. It's just that the value the, in terms of GDP that um, is associated with, uh, with you know, the productivity of that sector per, per hour is, uh, is relatively low. And so uh, the impact on GDP tends to be relatively low. So that's kind of the, you know, the illustration of the composition effect, whereas the financial sector is way down the list in terms of hours, but has a big impact on GDP nonetheless. So um, anyway, there are lots of other aspects to this one could consider, but I'm just uh, illustrating a couple. So of course, um, I think a lot of, we understand this already, but um, you know, the second and third waves have been less economically costly uh, than um, than the first, and uh, we can obviously gauge how much the difference is based by looking at these different estimates. Um, so these graphs just show employment by month for Canada and the GDP by month um, for Canada, the impact relative to what was anticipated. And of course, some of the some the gray area here is the past impact, and the the beyond that is our forecast based on a particular scenario. And I'll talk about these scenarios in a minute because this is just one of them. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, one could attribute this, this um, lower cost to various things. Um, but of course, these are just the economic costs on the health side. Um, and the second wave was obviously a lot worse in many respects. So um, we have estimates now for Canada, uh, for 2021, these are based on forecasts uh, in uh, particular scenarios, right? So, you know, there's, we're not trying to forecast the future, we're just saying that under this scenario, um, one scenario versus another, uh, these are the expected um, costs. And these two scenarios here are actually, uh, I'm gonna compare them in a, a, a shortly, a bit more carefully, but um, this continued mitigation um, scenario is essentially a, a scenario which we've seen up till now. So that is basically um, restrictions that are imposed and then uh, uh, relaxed quite perhaps as some would argue too quickly. Uh, that leads to um, uh, bad outcomes in terms of health and then there's a restriction again. This I guess one could say this happened um, earlier this year. Perhaps it could happen again as restrictions, you know, there's a lot of push for restrictions to be reduced now. Um, and uh, and that could lead to another uh, cycle. So, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about what, what, what the likelihood is. Hopefully the vaccines um, will uh, mitigate that, but we will have to see. There's a lot of debate about this right now. So um, this other, um, estimate here called Canadian Shield is based on um, a counterfactual. At the time we estimated it, it wasn't a counterfactual, it hadn't happened yet, but now it is a counterfactual where the, that restrictions that occurred 
earlier in the year, after after in, in the new year in January and February, would have been would have been held constant for longer. Um, and the implications for ep the epidemiological outcomes would have potentially been different. And so, um, so these kinds of estimates were looking at different scenarios of how this would out play out. And of course, well, again, we can't forecast the future, but we can at least describe these scenarios and uh, understand what their costs are. And so one of the things that we did find um, when we first started looking at this type of these types of scenarios, and this these, you know, there's a sense in which things are evolve very quickly over time. Well, there's not such a sense, it does. Um, so we when we first looked at this, we looked at this in December, we we did some um, scenarios um, based on the emerging second wave at that time. And this, under these scenarios, we considered these on and again, on again, off again kind of cycles versus this Canadian shield idea of just holding things um, tighter for longer. And one of the things that you find when you think about these modeling, this modeling, and just because of the inter interactions between sectors, um, is the economy takes time to uh, get back to normal. Uh, it takes time to rehire, restart operation, obviously work through inventory accumulation, and there's a bunch of ongoing supply chain restrictions that disrupt everything. So one of the, uh, uh, the, the findings is that it's often less costly, depending on the sector, to lock down for say two to three months in a row than to face an on again, off again cycle um, over time. So it's basically it's better to kind of recover once rather than multiple times and then go back into the lockdown again. Now, of course, that depends on there being uh, government support for industries in various ways, but, um, but that's one of the findings. Another big factor here is, has to do with the timing over the year, the seasonal impact, and in particular, the um, the cost of lockdowns are much higher in the worst impacted industries during the summer than the, than the winter. So uh, that has an impact as well. So this is just going back in time. We basically did this uh, scenario where we look we were looking at this given data in December 20, 19, uh, 2020 um, and forecasting over the following year. And these are the two kind of scenarios that I'm considering here that I mentioned, the continued mitigation and Canadian shield scenario. This is for the employment over the whole uh, uh, of Canada. Um, and the, the idea here is, although that this, this Canadian shield would have been costly at the beginning, because um, it would have avoided this cycle, overall, it turns out to be less costly. And there's a benefit as well, because if you're not in a lockdown during July and August, especially in some sectors, uh, that, that, that the costs of um, the costs are much lower. So that was, you know, just one example. And so one could break this down across different provinces. It affects different provinces differently depending on the, the sectors, the importance of the sectors in those provinces. Um, but we just provided some estimates based on that. And uh, you know, here's an, an example of the industrial breakdown of the benefits of the Canadian Shield over the alternative uh, the mitigations, the continued mitigation, that's what we called it, uh, just for Ontario. Um, and you can see, not surprisingly, the, these sectors that I'm referring to uh, that benefit the most are things like accommodation and food services, transportation, warehousing, and, 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 uh, and wholesale and retail trade, for example. So. Some of these things are probably not surprising, but that's that's where they're coming. That's where the, these outcomes are coming from. So as I said, this is a this is a moving target. Um, the original Canadian Shield analysis was done in December, as I just said. Um, we updated it in February and March, and then of course now we have to update it again. Um, but the point is that as we're going through time, we can at least consider these alternatives. And you know, at, when we get to this point, the net benefits, of course, of a, a, a more restrictive lock, uh, lockdown now are getting smaller as we get closer to the uh, the summer and as the vaccines take take um, have an effect. So, uh, so we, anyway, we can basically we the last time we made estimates of this, uh, these 
the gains were relatively well, somewhat smaller than um, they would have been had it been undertaken earlier. So that's uh, you know that's the type of scenario alternatives that we we were considering. We also uh, considered different scenarios related to um, vaccination, uh, the, the pace of vaccination. We looked at this earlier, and you know this is one way we can think about how uh, how costly the delays that we observed in the vaccine rollout. Of course, it's because it's much quicker now, but initially. There was a lot of delays, and uh, we try to put a dollar figure on on what the impact would be in terms of GDP across different provinces. So, again, I'm just illustrating some use cases of this type of tool. And then finally, um, everything I've talked about just because of time, I've focused on a lot of the uh, the aggregates here. But we also, uh, as I mentioned before, tried to regionalize a lot of the est these estimates. Um, we were working actually with um, the Eastern Ontario's Leadership Council, and in fact, they motivated us to think about this stuff in particular, where we developed this, um, for whom we developed this uh, dashboard, which would allow us to uh, generate estimates of the impact um, on different regions of the, of the, of the area of, the, of Eastern Ontario, including Frontenac, which is where Queen's is. Um, and uh, but also on different households and different industries in those areas. And of course, that relies on um, additional data that, you know, th th there's a lot of limitations, but, um, but that's the best we could do given the, uh, the, the data we have. And as I mentioned before, we get these kinds of, this is just an illustration of the, uh, the type of analysis uh, that's in this dashboard. I've mentioned this before. Under different scenarios, what the impact would be on different uh, measures of the cost of, of COVID. All right. So I've, uh, I've kind of run out of time here. So which is good because I've run out of things to say. Um, so the um, the future research, as was mentioned by Kate at the beginning, you know, there are, we've as we've gone through, we've learned you know a lot of things. We've learned some of the limitations of what we're trying to do. How we might be able to improve them going forward, um, improving these kinds of estimates, um, and you know one of the big questions that uh, we'd like to address is thinking about um, the interaction, more, more more careful modeling of the interaction between uh, the economic outcomes or the economic activities that are going on in the economy, uh, obviously, and uh, the disease itself um, or the infectious. Of the, so the disease modeling itself. So in particular, I mean, you know, other people have looked at this in the U.S. Um, in particular, uh, trying to understand how variation in economic activities in different industries can be um, can influence the actual evolution of um, transmission of the disease. This is tricky. Uh, there's a lot of issues here, um, but of course. Just because it's tricky doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Um, it's, it's, we're, and we're starting to think about this, as well as many other things associated with these interactions as part of the One Society Network, which was mentioned, um, which is a partnership uh, with the Institution of Health Economics. And so we're looking forward to uh, trying to improve on this kind of work and um, try to uh, understand the future pandemics or, or even future waves of the current pandemic um, better how think that how these things interact so uh, the uh, the one society network is uh, is more than just relating epidemiological modeling capacity and economic modeling capacity it's about the the specific sectors of the economy in particular education environment, um, the implications for different uh, groups in, in society, in indigenous, indigenous communities included, for example, the mental health, health implications, et cetera. So uh, it's a pretty broad set of issues, but uh, we're hoping we can contribute um, to this important discussion. So with that, I say thank you. And uh, um, and please, uh, if you have any questions after this or questions now, but also after this, you can find me at this email uh, that's on this slide. Um, but uh, 
uh, I'm, I'm done for now. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that, Hugh. Really uh, good presentation, lots of detail. And we do have a first question uh, on the deck. Uh, and this question is, the federal government has spent uh, $380 billion to manage the pandemic in 2020, plus all other provincial government's expenditures. How were those borrowing and expenses taken into account in estimation of the impact of the pandemic on Canada's economy? So that's a good question. So Yeah, I was thinking I, it is a good question. <laughs> I have some thoughts on how you could do it, <laughs> but yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So just to be clear, so um, a big part of that, um, not all of it, but a big part of that spending is coming from uh, the uh, the CERB, um, or some chunk of it anyway, and, and various kinds of uh, income replacement payment transfers that were undertaken. Those are actually incorporated into this model, uh, this modeling. It, um, however, um, you know, the, 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 the main cost that we're em emphasizing here is the production cost, which again is influenced by the demand side. Um, and so, but of course, the costs, the government costs um, of dealing with the pandemic in various ways do show up in terms of, if, you know, expenditures on goods and services. But um, to the extent that those expenditures, um, I guess it depends what we're talking about, but if we're talking about transfers to households, which is a big chunk, um, those, as we know, have been saved. Some of those have gone into savings. Um, and so that is not gonna be included in this because it's gonna affect future outcomes. So that 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 is a, um, uh, you know, I guess one could argue that these savings are going to be useful to pay off the debt um, going forward, but I suspect that they will contribute. And this is again, again one could one could debate this, of course, but a lot of those savings are going to be uh, contributing to a future economic boom potentially, um, which will kind of offset these costs to some extent. So um, now that may not be true, but if we look at what's happening in the U.S. right now, um, I suspect that you know people are holding back these expenditures and hopefully going to spend them in the future. Um, and of course, it, what exactly happens then depends on how the supply side responds, and we are already seeing these stresses, I guess, um, and so it could lead to rising prices, obviously. But um, but that's kind of how I'd answer that question. So that. You know, this is there are elements of the model which are very, very um, kind of static in terms of what we're thinking about here, just given the nature of the of the problem. Um, and so the dynamic consequences um, are going to show up in future um, estimates, right? So, um, so that's yeah. So that's the <laughs> it's kind of a roundabout way to answer the question. So the, the, those debt costs. Um, could impact demand in the future, but it depends to a large extent on how um, people react to and whether there's a, a sort of boom in the future, uh, hopefully in the next, in the summer, in response to um, to getting out of this crisis. Yeah, that's great. Um, one thing I would just slightly tack on there is that yeah, if you do care about any potential future drag on the economy debt, um, debt could create, uh, government debt could create, um, a computable general equilibrium model that kind of dynamically projects out into the future and has kind of endogenous um, interest rates basically, uh, might also be another way of thinking about that question specifically. Um, and then you could also do scenarios around there of um, if you were going to tax different activities in a boom to kind of cover, eat that down and things like that. Um, it is an interesting question. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and like I said, you know, our analysis here is as the as the model is, um, is indicates it's short term. Um, 
We, Real we, time. Yeah, exactly. It's a different que shaped question. Yeah. Yeah, but we, we, we did try to incorporate um, what we felt. You know, of course, it, okay, there's, a, there's a, also always a question of whether um, people, households today are re reacting to expectations about future taxes, for example, that they may have to pay, or they probably will have to pay. Um, and of course, that is a, an ongoing debate. We we, under, we understand that. It's just the, the, the nature of our framework isn't, isn't incorporated in that. What we did do was um, consider scenarios where, um, you know, going forward, people's demand is basically falling. So we're allowing for a change in the marginal propensity to consume currently as a mm -hmm. function of what we expect is going to happen in the future. Um, the problem is, is that up till now, at least, there doesn't seem to be any evidence of that. Um, so apart from the, the rising savings, which in a sense are mechanically arising because people, you know, the production is low um, and people can't spend the money on other things right now. No, they, they, it's a difficult hard, hard question whether that's because of what I just said or it's partly because um, people are actually anticipating future expenditures on taxation. Yeah. So the, the, I agree that these are good, important issues, and they're they're the. It's important to think about these longer run issues uh, from a different perspective. I think. Yep. So back to the uh, near term, um, we have a next question um, that is uh, the person asking the question is curious as to whether your work has informed any of the provincial governments and their decision on making the uh, aggressiveness of their public health measures. Um, so as I said, we, we have been talking to local um, uh, leaders, I guess you'd call them, um, and part of what they do is essentially lobby the, uh, they use this kind of information to lobby the provincial government for, uh, for various kinds of funding, I guess. Um, so that's, there's, there's an indirect way that's happened, but uh, I don't think, um, I don't know if we've had any direct, you know, big impacts on the decision making. And I, and I, you know, like I said, tried to say at the beginning, I think that, um, it's hard to make these, you know, it's hard to mechanically make these trade-offs between lives and livelihoods, for example. I mean, we kind of implicitly do, but making exact trade-offs is obviously difficult and different governments uh, are doing different things in res with respect to that. Um, so I wouldn't want to state that anyone's been, the, that's, you know, used our numbers precisely to make these decisions, no. Yep, okay, fair. Uh, and the next question, um, digging into uh, what you mentioned about uh, education in the research, uh, and the person asks, can you elaborate on how economic impacts can be measured for learning loss due to school closures, potentially virtual learning, and so on? Okay, so in, these estimates don't have that in there, right? These are just about current activities, which, which of course, is an issue, right? When in general, in terms of what, you know, when Statistics Canada is measuring GDP, for example, or even, and when we're doing it here, because we're using a kind of similar framework in, in many respects. Um, when we think about GDP, we're essentially measuring it, in, in, in the educational sector, we're essentially measuring it at cost. So we don't know, you know, the actual production is some, is, is, is things that could potentially happen in the future impacting people's um, productivity, et cetera. Um, and of course, that's not something that is measured really in GDP. The there's an assumption about um, that re being reflected in the costs. Um, but sort of that's not just, that just making that observation. But anyway, the, the issue of how to think about education, um, I mean, we're not, again, this, I guess that's sort of tangential to what we're doing here, but, uh, a number of other economists are working on this, including one of my co-authors here, Chris Cotton, um, who, you know, would, I guess there's different aspects of this, but understanding the impacts, of course, depends on uh, understanding the time, the, 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 part, the time loss in education, um, and also the importance of the education sector 
in the economy overall. Um, there are some other people looking at that. So I think at UBC, the, uh, Henry Sue and other people are looking at um, the impacts. This is slightly different, but looking at the impacts in terms of lost, sorry, the, the cost to people who have kids who aren't at school in terms of their uh, um, impact on production, like their current production. They're not able to work uh, as many hours, and so there's an impact there as well. So I'm not really answering the question very well. I think it's a difficult one to answer because uh, if we're thinking about long-term impacts of current act, um, restrictions on, edu on educational outcomes and the consequent productivity impl implications, that's a tricky one. <laughs> so I, yeah. I don't have a lot to say about that. Yeah, I mean, and it, it's the kind of thing where there's many facets to that and it may take more than one modeling approach. Some of those naturally nest into something that's an economy-wide consideration. Some, some won't. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. multifaceted uh, question, multi, multifaceted approach to answering it. Yeah, and I think uh, we have a lot of dynamic models. Maybe we don't have good enough ones. Maybe there's some a lot of room to work on them, and especially to quantify them, um, to think about those longer run questions. Um, and I think that's that's going to be a, a big area of analysis going forward. Yep. Okay. Uh, this is probably the last question we have time for. Uh, one person in our audience is curious about how currency uh, features into the analysis and specifically, is money printing and inflation captured or possible to capture in modeling of future scenarios in this work? So, uh, so the current modeling, it, it's not, it doesn't play a role. And in fact, um, and this is another aspect of the short-term nature of the modeling. Um, we're assuming across the sectors that we're looking at is not much substitution. I mean, there's no changes in the in the in the sort of input-output structure that's going on. This is an important question because you know that only is going to hold for a short period of time. Um, and as a result, the price adjustments that one might consider aren't really. You know, there are the idea of the, this model is it's a context in which prices really are not adjusting in response to constraints, and sort of managers are having to make decisions um, about how to allocate um, resources. And we think that that's a good, relatively good description of things up till now, let's say, or maybe a month ago, uh, where and and you know we didn't see a lot of price movements, we didn't see a lot of wage movements in general, well, there's a few. Um, but now, as we've seen, we're already seeing some, pre we're seeing a lot of pressure. Part of that's being driven by um, booms in the US and China, for example, and other constraints, not necessarily related to the pandemic. I mean, the lumber crisis seems to be related more to things that have happened before the pandemic in BC. But so there's, there's a lot, anyway, the point being that, again, one wants to think about price movements and obviously associated with that is monetary policy, one would need to think about different kinds of models or extensions of this model. So we actually are developing an extension uh, that allows for more realistic, uh, sort of more longer run features like this where prices are moving um, uh, in response to these constraints. And I think that is important uh, in the, what I've discussed here, it's, it doesn't play a role. Great. Um, thank you for that. And um, as I mentioned, that would be our last question. So, you know, if we were in person, we'd all be giving you a round of applause and thanks. Uh, and um, yeah, that marks our last seminar for this uh, fourth cycle of NOAA rounds. Thank you all for joining us. Um, if you have any follow up questions uh, on this seminar about rounds in general, feel free to reach out to noah at ihe.ca. That's N-O-A-H-E at ihe.ca. And you can visit the NOAA website to uh, sign up for our mailing list and to see news on upcoming events. Um, so thank you, everyone.